The Seventh Tower by Garth Nix. Book Six, The Violet Keystone. Chapter 14. Ito led Tal and Crow through a series of ever-narrowing corridors used by the Underfolk waiters. It became clear why the waiters were mainly young children, as there were several places where Tal and Crow had to crawl or squeeze through gaps as the serving way ran under floors or inside a wall. Sometimes there were peepholes to look through, or hatches where food could be left, but Ito led them at a cracking pace, and there was no time to steal a glance. Finally, they came to an intersection of four equally narrow corridors. Ito pointed along the left-hand one, which ended in a small door, and said, Through there's the Grand Parade. Doors to the audience chamber across the Grand Parade. Then he scampered away along the opposite corridor, his forefinger already jammed in his nose again. Crow squeezed along the corridor, Tal following a little way behind, with Adris at his shoulder. Tal still wanted to keep Crow in front where he could see him, though the Free Folk leader had behaved perfectly so far. Doc, take that boy, swore Crow softly as he examined the door. What is it? This isn't really a door, said Crow. It's a hole in the wall with a painting or something hung over it. I'm going to have to push the painting off the wall and it's bound to make a noise. If there's anyone on the Grand Parade, they'll know about it. You can't lift it off quietly? asked Tal. No, it's too heavy. Can you cut through it? asked Tal, thinking of the portraits of former lectors that were hung in the lectorium. They were painted on cloth stretched on metal frames. Crow tapped the obstruction again and shook his head. It's made of something solid. I think it's a thin sheet of metal. It might even be a mirror. I guess we'll just have to risk it, Tal said finally, and hope that everyone is down fighting ice girls. Crow nodded and began to push at the top of the sheet. It slowly shifted with a screeching sound that set Tal's hair on edge. Hurry up, he said. The continuous screech of metal on stone was bad enough, let alone any other noise. Adris, help him! Adris flowed around Tal and pushed with his huge, puffy arms. Almost immediately, the screeching stopped, and the whole sheet of metal fell forward, letting in bright, violet-tinged sunstone light from the broad corridor beyond. Crow, Tal, and Adris watched the rectangle of metal fall, all of them tensed for the sound it would make. But none of them were prepared for the tremendous crash that did eventuate, nor the ringing sound that continued afterward, a ringing that echoed everywhere. Light flashed everywhere, too, for the sheet was a mirror of highly polished silver. It quivered on the floor, sending wild flashes in all directions. Quick, said Tal, and the three of them squeezed out into the grand parade. With the ringing still in their ears, they looked every which way for possible enemies and somewhere to run to. Then they all stopped and stared. Diagonally opposite them were two enormous arched doors. They were made of the ancient's golden metal, but studded with tiny sunstones so that they shone in all colors, ripples of rainbow light constantly shimmering across their surface. Both doors were partly open. But neither the sunstone-laden doors nor the fact that they were open had stopped Tal and Crow in their tracks. It was the piled-up bodies of dead Chosen sprawled in front of the doors. More than a dozen of them, including Chosen in violent robes and guards. There were no sign of any spirit shadows. The last echo faded away, and the silver mirror lay still. Sushin did get here first, said Crow. Tal nodded and tore his gaze away to check along the Grand Parade. He'd never been here before, though he had come to the Violet Levels once. The Grand Parade lived up to its name as a sweeping, broad corridor that went for stretches and stretches in either direction before it curved away. There was no one in sight, at least no one alive. Tal went forward to examine the dead Chosen. They all looked surprised rather than afraid. None of them had sunstones in their hand or anywhere visible, and the guard's swords were still sheathed. There was also no obvious cause of death. No wounds, no burn marks, no other signs of fatal light magic. I wonder why he killed them, muttered Tal as he moved between the bodies, Crow close by his side, both of them with their sunstones held ready. And how? 
A slight movement near one of the doors made them spin nervously, red light flashing in their sunstones. One of the guards, propped up against the wall, was not dead after all, and she had moved her hand. Tao recognized her. It was Ethar, a Shadow Lord of the Violet and a senior officer of the guard. Her hand twitched again, and Tao realized she was trying to get him to approach. Who walks there? whispered the woman, raising her head a little. Her eyes did not focus on anything. With a start of horror, Tal knew she was blind. Tal Grail he said, stepping over a body to get closer. He was still ready for a sudden attack, but did not think one would come, at least not from Ethar. Her face was as pallid as the dead chosen, and he knew she would not live long. A momentary smile crossed Ethar's lips. The beast make a boy, she said, and coughed. With the cough came a froth of bright red blood that bubbled out of the corner of her mouth. He played well. Did Sushin do this? asked Tao. Has he gone into the audience chamber? Athar did not answer immediately. Her chest heaved, and more blood stained her lips. Then she said, Yes and yes. We protest to inform that he was the dark vizier and could command us. He had no right to try the doors. He showed us the violet keystone and told us to be silent, that he would be emperor and do as he willed. But even with the keystone, the assembly must decide. We told him, we told him he could not pass. Tao waited as she stopped and drew in a racking breath. He blinded us then with the keystone, and in the darkness spoke words, words that felled our spirit shadows in an instant. I felt my Karakar go torn away from me. I almost went with him. But I did not. Duty. It is my duty. You must stop him, Tal, for he should not be emperor. He must not be. I will stop him, if I can said Tal. I ask one small boon before you go, whispered Ethar, from one player to another. End this game. What, what do you mean? asked Tal, but he knew what she meant. A red ray, whispered Ethar, her hand crawling across to tap weakly against her heart. Here, do not let me linger. Tal raised his sunstone. Red light swirled inside it, building in intensity. Then a single thin ray snapped out, striking Ethar exactly where she'd indicated. Her body jerked, then slowly subsided down the wall. Tal wiped his eyes and turned away. I never did. I never did kill anyone, you know, said Crow quietly. Not a single chosen, for all my talk. I couldn't do what you... I couldn't. I couldn't either, croaked Tal, before I met the ice carls, before... before everything. Kerr was about to say something else when Adris suddenly reared up and looked down the grand parade. What is it? asked Tal. Is someone coming? Yes said Adris. A monster.